Bibliophiles of the internet, my name is Adriana and today I'm here to give you five reasons to read one of my all-time favorite books, In Other Lands by Sarah Rhys Brennan. This is a satirical queer fantasy about extremely obnoxious by disaster Elliot Schaefer who realizes he is one of the few people who can see this otherwise invisible wall separating the human world from a magical world called the Borderlands. From that point, he's given a choice. Go back to the world as he's always known it, or journey into the borderlands to ensure the safety and prosperity of magical creatures and humans alike. Because he doesn't really have anything or anyone to go back to, he decides to take a chance and escape into this magical place. Elliot quickly realizes that as a pacifist, he is not cut out to fight, so he enrolls himself in the council training course instead to learn how to navigate all of these different cultural groups and to learn to draft treaties that will hopefully ensure peace. And by applying himself in all these new ways, Elliot is realizing that he has so much more to give than anyone ever thought. Reason number one is that Elliot as a character is so emotionally rich and complex. This is like my biggest bullet point, so I need you to stick with me on this. Elliot is an elaborate contradiction of traits. Outwardly, he presents himself as this obnoxious, pretentious person, which is partially true, but it stems from something so much deeper than that. When he was young, his mom left him with his dad without any explanation or so much as a look back, and ever since then, his father has been self-medicating with alcohol to basically ease the pain of Elliot's existence. That is not a great life. Elliot doesn't know what it means to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted or welcomed in any sense. No one shows up for him. No no one's ever cared enough to stick around and see if he's gonna be okay. So he preemptively protects himself by making himself seem extremely annoying and obnoxious because it would most likely break him if he were to be rejected again in earnest. But at the same time, he's hilarious and quick-witted and honest because he allows himself to just say whatever the fuck he feels because the consequences of that seem so much less compared to everything else he's ever faced. And Elliot is incredibly smart, he's confident, he's fearless, he has so much conviction, and above everything else, he is passionate about transparency and compassion and fairness. By its very nature, his job in the council training course is to close the gaps and create bridges between all these different magical groups, to find the connection and common ground between those groups and use it to ensure peace. Before Elliot came to the Borderlands, there were a lot of poorly constructed treaties that cheated certain groups out of their rights due to very blatant loopholes, and Elliot's entire stance is, we cannot keep doing this. And I think that conviction comes from how he's so sensitive to the feelings and desires of other folks. He can definitely be obtuse at times as a byproduct of his detail-oriented mindset, but at his core, he is so empathetically generous. You constantly see this in his narration where he's thinking, this person most likely feels this way because of these reasons. I understand what they're thinking. Their perspective is valid. They have a right to feel the way they do. If I were them, I wouldn't feel any different. Whether he realizes it or not, he's constantly doing that, and I think he just affords everyone else the dignity and complexity that has for so long been denied to himself. I want to be clear, he does grow a lot over the course of the book, and he does have to learn how to better express himself in ways that are less asshole-ish, but he has so much good in his mind and in his heart. Reason number two is that the satirical tone woven throughout this book really shows that sexism and all forms of prejudice are highly ridiculous. I love when authors use fantasy worlds as an opportunity to upend social norms and gender norms, and that's exactly what this book does. In the Borderlands, Elliot has two close friends, an incredibly accomplished elf named Serene and the prodigal golden boy beloved by every living person named Luke. In Serene's elven culture, gender roles are completely backwards from what Elliot knows. Feminine elves are elevated above everyone else. They're viewed as inherently powerful and strong, and in elven society, they are extremely privileged. Masculine elves, on the other hand, are seen as the softer sex who need to be protected and sheltered and whose dispositions are considered to be too gentle to fight or make progress. So there's a lot of times when Elliot and Luke are just trying to be useful and prove themselves only to have Serene say something wildly condescending about their roles and draw them up short. They're so unused to confronting that condescension and that prejudice that most times they can't even think of an appropriate response. It's interesting because it's not done in a way that frames Serene as toxic, even though she does have a lot of room to learn and grow, but just as someone who's become a natural product of that mindset and that environment. It's also funny because it's so surprising and something that's so different from real life that it makes you think about why and how we internalize and perpetuate certain ideas. Not only that, but it makes you think about how you sound when you put that out into the world and vocalize those wildly incomplete thoughts. 
Reason number three is that this story challenges the typical hierarchy of physical strength over intellect. In the Borderlands camp, there are two types of courses, the war training course and the council training course. From day one, it's made very clear that soldiers are valued over diplomats. The war training course gets more respect, more resources, more staff, and special treatment, while the council training students are basically seen as worthless, powerless nerds. And it's interesting because this main trio represents so many different parts of that spectrum. We have Luke, who's an exalted soldier, Elliot, who's a fierce advocate for council training, and Serene, who's actually enrolled in both courses. And because each of them offers a different perspective on which attributes should be valued the most, they really help each other grow to be extremely well-rounded young adults. Elliot, again, this secretly thoughtful boy who cares deeply about fairness, puts it best when he says, do you not want warriors who are brilliant and diplomats who are brave? They're not mutually exclusive concepts, nor should they be. Furthermore, no matter how many fights the army wins, no matter how many groups they temporarily ally themselves with, if they cannot establish true connections and draft agreements that acknowledge the rights of every party involved, they will never be able to sustain peace. Everyone thinks of Elliot as this eccentric freak when he's really just taking the initiative to actually learn the language of trolls and elves and mermaids so that he can create those connections in good faith, which will help them get closer to attaining that peace. And slowly he's starting to make his commanders realize that treaties are so much more than just words. At the same time, while Luke makes a case for why fighting renders a necessary service of protection for people who can't protect themselves, it's also true that, as Elliot says, the value of people does not rest on their ability to hurt others. Reason number four is how this story explores the fundamental importance of choosing and being chosen in return, but also just the power of making a choice. This is big for Elliot, as I mentioned, because of his fairly closed off loveless background and because he doesn't know what it means to be chosen absolutely and to be chosen first especially as part of the council training course always being seen as second best or a nuisance everyone just has to put up with out of necessity, I feel like that void is made even more apparent. And the act of being chosen is happening on so many different levels because now he finds himself in this magical land that for whatever reason has chosen him in so many ways. Now he's found a diplomatic calling that's chosen him because of his sensitivity to misunderstood people and his drive to do right by those folks. But he also finds himself chosen by his friends who see through this pretentious facade and who are willing to stick around because they know he's not just some careless idiot, but someone who cares very deeply and someone with clear vision and intent. There's also parallels of being chosen with Luke, because since he's always been put on a pedestal and revered so much, he's often just blindly adored and chosen by default. No one takes the time to figure out who he really is or what he cares about. But he also finds himself chosen by Serene and Elliot, who see him as so much more than just the prodigal son who's beautiful and flawless. It's a choice to love someone else. It's a choice to see someone else for who they truly are. And that's an integral part of this book. And choice itself plays a powerful role in this story because we have to choose to see others as equals. We have to choose to make things right. Perfection is an illusion. As a people, we make a lot of mistakes, and that's okay as long as we commit ourselves to righting those wrongs as many times as it takes. As people, we enter into an agreement to choose to do right by each other, and that's the very definition of humanity itself. And reason number five, this story says just because you don't understand something or someone different doesn't mean they're not worth understanding in the first place. So Elliot is not only fascinated by this amazing world that's opened itself up to him, but he is incredibly dedicated to understanding its inhabitants. On a granular level, he genuinely wants to know what defines these creatures. Why are they the way that they are? What affects them the most? What do they care about? And people give him such a hard time when he chases that instinct because it's never been done. People don't do that. It's easier to write off trolls as lumbering idiots and mermaids as bloodthirsty monsters. But dismissal is not something that interests Elliot. He will go to great lengths to make contact with these different groups. He'll pick up pen pals who are dwarves and elves and mermaids and harpies, and he will be undyingly faithful in writing those letters because he finds so much purpose within that cultural exchange. This book really says, if you can learn from and about the world you occupy, why wouldn't you do it? Become a responsible global citizen. Learn, connect, fix what you can salvage. Choose to treat others as equals. Elliot is constantly questioning by whose metric are magical creatures less. If we simply give up on what we don't understand, what does that say about us? 
one of my absolute favorite quotes that perfectly sums this up is as follows. Inscribed on the stone were symbols he had never seen before in a language he did not know. He did not know if it could possibly be a message from the mermaid he had met or whether it was a different mermaid, curious and reaching out. He did not know what the message said, but he could learn what the words meant, learn to speak the language of strangers. He could find out and reach out. And thus concludes my impassioned love letter to In Other Lands, which I truly, truly hope you will pick up if you haven't yet. If any of these five reasons resonated for you, or if you've read this gem yourself, I would love to hear from you in the comments. But that's everything I had for this review and recommendation today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I will catch you on the flip side of the page. Bye!